The show is strictly for educational purposes. The opinions expressed on the show are personal to the individuals appearing in the show and not those of Thinking Tree Ecoholics Private Limited. The show is not intended to offend or defame any individual, entity, caste, community, race or religion or to denigrate any institution, person, living or dead. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hello and welcome to Ecoholics Thinking Tree series. Today we have with us very distinguished personality and a very knowledgeable professor, Dr. Subodh Mathur. Welcome, sir. Welcome to our show. Thank you for inviting me. He has done his PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, United States of America. Currently ranked one as the for the uh, for the students of economics to do PhD. Today we'll discuss about an insight on Indian economy, state control versus free market. Because Subodh Mathur, sir, is very important personality when we talk about the control and the free market. He has written a lot of articles in Times of India and other various newspapers. He also taught various universities as a guest lecturer, as a professor in the universities of and the colleges of the United States of America. So today we'll start with the uh, with the important insight on the Indian economy. As we all are aware, the 1991 reforms were a historical step towards the liberalization of Indian economy. But did they push us on the right path? Was the growth provided by them sustained? Are we still following the protectionist policy? Are some debates still left unanswered? In today's discussion, we will look at some of the crucial aspects of Indian market today. To begin with, sir, there are two popular opinions in India. One says that government interventions are extremely necessary to pull India out of its growth stagnancy. The other opinion is that too much government intervention is what has brought us to this stagnancy or the low growth, hence letting the market forces taking control is the way forward. Which opinion do you side with and why? Well, let me first say that uh, India is not stagnant. India actually has never been stagnant except for 20 years. In the 1950s and 60s, we didn't have rapid growth but we built the foundations of growth. So we created all of these institutions that we are so proud of today, like ISRO, IITs, IIM, and we set up a whole system of governance that uh, the rule of law by the Supreme Court holds, the army doesn't interfere in politics, we hold regular elections, chief ministers lose, prime ministers lose. All these were very important institutions that were built. And more important, India was not a country when we became independent. Sardar Patel put together the princely states, but he died before he could actually integrate all of India. And in the 1950s and 60s, the progress was on building the foundations. Unfortunately, in the 1970s and 1980s, we wasted our time. We didn't build on it. We'd got nothing. There were no new institutions created and no growth took place either. Till we became bankrupt in 1990, we really had no choice at the mm -hmm. time because there was not a single dollar in the treasury. Reforms since then are incomplete. We need to do more. The mm -hmm. question you have posed is, should the market be allowed to do everything? The answer is obviously no. We need and we don't need government ownership. The problem yes. is not government intervention, but needless government ownership and interference in the normal working of institutions, like in banking. Like we have NPAs in our banks. <clears throat> Most of them are due to loans that won't be paid back because they were politically motivated. So it's really the wrong government intervention. Example is the power sector power sector, the distribution companies are all bankrupt, not all, most, yes. some are doing very well. Others could just copy them and do as well, but the chief ministers are sleeping, they don't wake up. So we need both our chief ministers and the prime minister to follow right economic policies. <clears throat> and then the market will do its job, but we need those policies. So I would say that economists are asking for economic reform. They are not asking for government to completely go away. We want the government to be there to help and support. 
lay to build on the foundations that were laid and over time since 1990 we have come so far we had no dollars at that time 1991 today we have 500 billion dollars that's a remarkable achievement you know it's a huge amount of money none of our neighbors have that so we can't say it's stagnant we can say that india has done reasonably well but doing reasonably well is not enough india needs to do bloody well let me put it in strong terms we need to do bloody well because we still have poor people we still have people who cannot get jobs and unless we do much much better we cannot hope to become a economic regional superpower we cannot be a national international superpower in any at least my lifetime but we can be a regional super economic superpower if we had the right policies so it's a combination of the government and the markets we cannot neglect the markets and we cannot neglect the government i think that's my answer uh so when we talk about the role of the government in the words of adam smith state must only control defense communication and foreign affairs rest must be left at the disposal of market mechanism times have changed along with the role of the government what according to you must be controlled today and what should be left for the market well see the word control is not the same as ownership okay. yes the ownership should be in selected sectors only control can be everywhere because regulation that's a different story and many things have to be regulated even uh, worker safety has to be regulated even in small companies yes Pro- product quality has to be regulated so government has a regulatory role which is legitimate which is broad and goes into many sectors and then in certain sectors what i find from my worldwide experience is that in education health infrastructure but the government has a key role if you look mm-hmm. at the top 100 universities list put out by anybody yes. you won't find that the universities in that list are from the market you can yes. look at any list i yes. i'm not saying i prefer this list or that list you take any list of top 100 universities in the world and show me one private for profit university you won't find it right you won't so mm-hmm. why what you just mentioned mit is number one but mit is not a profit oriented oxford cambridge harvard any technical university they are not profit oriented so we need to have that recognition now they need not be government they can be non profit so actually mm-hmm. we have three sectors the government ownership the non profit and the for profit so the non profit we find in health and education the top hospitals in the world are non profit they yes. are not running on a profit basis right they are taking yes. their money from donations they are taking their mm-hmm. money from the government they are taking their money from the patients but they are not in the market in the for profit sense yes and yes. research which is part of education i unfortunately india has failed significantly in the government role in education our primary schools owned by the state governments are let me put it simply awful you can just read the uh, reports put out by various groups pratham you can read pratham's report acer report and Sorry. what they show is that even poor people are paying money in private schools to send their children there because they don't believe in government schools you go to the slums in mumbai and you find that all the parents there say sir we are sending our children to private school mm-hmm. uh, we don't see movies we don't buy clothes we don't do this we don't do that but we have to send our children to private school these government schools are useless so just because the government has a role doesn't mean that the government's doing a good job in fact it's doing an awful job so yes it has a role in education non profit also health non profit infrastructure yes but look at the infrastructure role in the power sector which i know quite a bit about i mean our discoms most of them are just terrible i mean yes we have five or six states where they are doing very well there's no reason why others can't copy them so yes. we have government failure where the role of the government is there 
in that's what i'm saying that we have a legitimate role for the government but you know the whole telephone business was owned by the government since i'm old i know the old days right but now everything is private right, right. the cell phones are all private and there's no government has bsnl but you know bsnl is like a side show you know there's nobody seriously saying that bsnl is serving the nation no jio is serving the nation right everybody is on jio right? yes. so even in infrastructure we can try to have a role for the private sector with regulation now try is there to try is regulating jio that we have the government we have the non profit and we have the for profit now in adam smith's time the non profit didn't exist or maybe mm-hmm. it existed but he ignored it i'm sure the coxford and cambridge were there at that time but he didn't think of them as non profit it so, was very small then that particular time yeah but anyway so what i'm saying is that india needs to invest in research and we are failing very badly we are lagging behind in artificial intelligence we are lagging behind in uh, technology in biology we are back uh, lagging behind in machine learning not because we don't have smart people we are smart people we have the mm-hmm. smartest people in the world because they are able to do this in spite of a lousy education system imagine mm-hmm. what they could do if they had the right tools and equipment back home yes. okay so that's my answer because uh, largest companies or, or uh, top 100 companies a lot of ceos are from indian origin so we actually are running uh, major companies it means we have the talent but it's like ex- infrastructure we need to support that talent yeah i mean look we are indians are running microsoft they are running google they are running this they are running that so and these are not people even from iits um, yes, sundar pichai is from iit but nadella is not so we have a depth of people and we can give them the freedom we don't i mean we are still using the same operational model for iits and iim that was built in the 1950s and 60s that model doesn't work anymore it was essential we were building these institutions nobody knew how they would come out so we needed a lot of control because you know india was not even a country you had to make sure that admission was on merit not on regional considerations right those were very powerful at that time so you had to have this kind of all india national approach which we built successfully and now it has become a weakness because the government is saying oh i'll make this person the director i'll make that person the director they are fighting with the heads of the iits and the education ministry which has no clue on what higher education and research is about is actually butting into their affairs all the time so we need to get those people and then we start talking about centers of excellence and it's a failed plan nothing's come of it you give it a center of excellence to some institution that doesn't even exist in the hope that it will become and even those that exist they don't really need the government in- interference the indian institute of science is such an old and established place they need their freedom they need to be able to do it their way and if they don't they'll fail or we are feeling right now so what's the problem okay so that's what i'm saying that we need the right policies we need the right support and we need to be future looking most important we need to be looking at the future all the time since you were mentioning about the uh, labor or the the we have supply of labor and india has a comparative advantage in a uh, competitive advantage in abundant supply of labor how can we turn this into a competitive advantage i think the answer is short and straightforward uh, we need to focus on our small and medium enterprises that the union government had neglected this idea for years because they were talking about make in india bring fdi now fdi is fine i am not against fdi let it come but it won't create jobs it won't give the local labor because they bring in the same production technology that they are using in other countries right so if you look at the car manufactured in india it's hardly any different from what it is in other countries so this not using labor because the labor is not abundant in those countries yes so what mm-hmm. we need is 
uh, to promote the small and medium enterprises. Now, certainly the union government has made its agenda, and I will come in. And they talk about uh, collateral free loan. And they talk about this mudra, which is. But really, the future of these MSMEs depends on the chief ministers. And that has been my standard view, which I've been writing for two or three years, four years, that unless you focus on the MSMEs, and there's no way that Delhi or the union government, they have no clue, they have no data, they have no contact to touch them, right? There's no way. Those people are being buffeted every day by indifferent and corrupt state government machinery. They have to pay bribes, they don't have any support. If they have an issue, they cannot turn to their local engineering college or their local business college to say, okay, come and help me. We need that function. We need just like, you know, in the 1960s, we were trying to help the farmers with agricultural extension. And even today, there is some agricultural extension that people can go and give an idea. We need to build that system. Now, there's one foundation called Desh Pandey Foundation. Desh Pandey. Mr. Desh Pandey is, uh, lives in the U.S. He's a billionaire. He set up Desh Pandey Foundation. They are working in South India, around Hubli, because that's where he's from. And they are urging college students to be involved with the local business. That's their nonprofit foundation approach. Now, you guys are smart. Go and work with them. Help them. So mm-hmm. the governments are sitting back and saying, fill this form, fill that form, do this, do that. What they mm-hmm. actually need to say is, what's your issue? What's holding you back? What's your mm-hmm. problem? And we can connect you to a local college, local professor, local university, and we will reduce your red tape. Now, the, you know, we are so proud of ease of doing business index jump. Good. We did that. But that's for big companies in big cities. Right? It's not for small companies in small cities. Okay. Now, unless you go to each small city, by small, I mean tier two. Okay. Let's not take the top 10. Let's take below the top 10. I mean, in Jaipur is, I think, 10th. I'm proud to say it. But we go to the smaller cities, we go to the district headquarters. That's where the people are, labor. Mm -hmm. Unless you want them all in slums of Mumbai and Delhi and Kolkata. You want to go to the district headquarters. And you want to go there and say, listen, small businesses, you know, your chai wala, your this wala, your thele wala. you got to help those guys grow. Now, some of them will grow and some of them will not grow. But Mm -hmm. as they grow, they will hire more people. And that's where. Now, you know, if you look at, by the way, Germany's exports, Germany today is one of the most export dependent economies. Exports are almost 60 to 70 percent of the GDP, more than any other country like China or US or India. And we don't buy any German stuff. But Mm -hmm. what they are doing is their small and medium sized firms are specialists in particular technologies. They make things that are used by other companies and only they can make it. They've built up their small and medium enterprises to be world class. Our small and medium enterprises are Indian class. I'm sorry to say maybe better than Pakistan, but who cares? They are not world class. They are not got the latest technology. Uh, And now we have the technology. We can, you know, we were talking laptops. They couldn't be brought into the laptop business. But with the smartphones, all the apps are, many young people I know these days, they are writing apps for Indian businesses. I know some people who are right in ag tech. In ag tech, they are writing apps for farmers. We could similarly have apps for small businesses so that they can tap into the worldwide knowledge, uh, not only of Indians in India, but also NRIs and support, financial support, technical support. So what I'm suggesting is that like we had agricultural extension, we need to have small business extension Mm. and a friendly attitude. Don't stop all these stupid bribe demands for every small paper that you have to file. And I know because I also paid that. So I used to have a small business when I was in Jaipur. You have to pay a bribe for every small thing. 
We need to stop this. The chief ministers need to do it. We can talk about, oh, the union government's not so corrupt. It doesn't matter because the small fellow is still paying. So that's where we can use our data. Uh, with the massive effort by the government to provide benefits to the unorganized sector, do you think that India will continue to be an informal economy in the near future? I think it will be a semi-formal economy. We are moving. We need to re not be afraid of informal. We need to only think about what is the wage that they are earning in the informal sector. Right? If they are earning, I mean, by my calculations, if you are in a tier two city and you are making less than ten thousand rupees a month, then you are in trouble. You need to be able to make 10 to 12,000 rupees a month, 10,000 if you're young, depends on the cost of living and the place, whether you're staying with your parents or not staying with your parents, circumstances. But if you are going to have a family, you need 12,000 rupees a month. Today's prices I'm talking about, in my estimate, by looking and talking to various people. And we need not feel scared so long as they make 12 to 15,000 rupees a month that this is the informal sector. We don't need everybody at 25, 30,000 rupees a month right now. We can't get there. So forget, I would say, I don't think of informal and formal. I would think of what is the wage that they're earning. Now today, if you go to see the uh, informal sector, like you go to a shop, uh, which mm -hmm. is not a big fancy shop, but one of our old conventional shops, you'll find three or four papus hanging around. They're all underemployed. They can't make 12,000 rupees a month. They make six or 8,000 rupees a month. And there is no job future for them. They will continue to do the same thing. In the chai dukan, that fellow is there. Those boys are serving tea and all. You know, what are they going to do? They are not going to make 15,000 rupees a month in the near future. Right? There's no job prospects for them. So, and they cannot shift to the formal sector. They don't have the skills. And that, by the way, comes to my point on labor, that India today has almost 40% of its labor force in agriculture. And only 15% of the GDP comes from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge surplus of workers sitting in agriculture. They will have to come out of it because they cannot thrive there, they cannot survive there. Plus, they are going to be low skilled workers who move out. We don't have top engineering colleges in villages. We don't even have mediocre engineering colleges. So they are not going to be engineers. They're going to be high school maximum, maybe one year of college, two years of college. So this is our future millions of people, right? You're asking about our labor. This is our future labor force. For the next 10 years, you are going to get 18 to 20 year olds whose parents are saying enough, we need money, you need to earn. You need to get out and get a job, right? So these are the people. They are not going to be your IITs or NITs or engineering colleges or physics or science or anything. They're going to be high school pass maximum and that too from a mediocre high school. So let's recognize the reality. These are the people whom we can give jobs. We need some training for them. We need some trade schools for them to teach them how to be more productive. Let's, so not, we can't just say, okay, we support the small and medium enterprises because they said these people, they can't do the work. Seriously. They're not competent. So yes. they've come out, but there's no place. There's no night education. There is no evening classes. We need to train these people. Then they become a powerful, productive force. So we need to know who's coming. These are the people who are coming. I mean, those who are already there in the cities, 30 years old, high school pass, what are you going to do with them? Not much. Okay. <clears throat> but the 16 to 18 year old who are coming out of the village in desperation because there's no place to earn any money. Now, there should be some way to make them better skilled so that they become productive. So that's my message that we need to, they can only be absorbed in small and medium enterprises. They need, we need to recognize they are not going to be high skilled workers. 
they are going to be people whom we can train a little bit and they are motivated because they are coming to jump out of real poverty yes. they are young they are motivated and they are hard working let's have an economic approach to look after them and let's not ask the union government to do it coming coming back to my point each state knows its people we can't mm. have an all india policy it doesn't work we are too big too diverse we yes. need to know each chief minister knows okay these are my people this is what i can do for them Indeed. so that's again my same message yes a great point ma uh sir uh, while commenting on atmanirbhar bharat do you feel that even today despite the unsatisfactory results india is continuing with inward looking control oriented development policy increasingly in the 19 in the early 2000s uh, we had given up the inward looking yes it was not a political issue if you look at what happened when mr vajpay was prime minister we joined the wto and we enthusiastically joined the w- i think we joined the wto before his time but we mm-hmm. really made it work mm-hmm. so we were outward looking and our export started booming in the software in the bpo bpo is an export right even mm-hmm. though the workers are still in india they are earning dollars so that's an export mm-hmm. right so mm-hmm. everything where you earn foreign currency is an export so we were really uh, trying to give our young people uh, the job opportunities that were export oriented we were trying mm-hmm. to increase tourism but unfortunately we are no longer following that to the same degree yes we are we haven't given up but there is a feeling that uh, we are dependent on somebody else Yes. well <clears throat> you can cut yourself off and be self reliant but that's not a formula for growth not yes. in india so maybe you know i'm not saying india should be totally export oriented what i'm saying is that we need to focus on removing the constraints that are preventing us from being world class there should be only one objective that indian economy is world class or at least parts of it are world class mm-hmm. and that's doable because we have the people there is no question we have the people we have the talent we have the skills we have the uh, foundations of our social and political institutions like okay there's going to be an election right we know the prime minister is going to lose right we know and the next prime minister is going to come and we don't have to think that there'll be a coup or there'll be some issue or nothing you know chief ministers come and chief ministers go and nobody cares that they lost or they won it's not an issue the army is not going to run our country the supreme court's not going to be totally biased right so we know all these things we have our education system good or bad as it is still producing people like you and me so it's doing something lot mm-hmm. is settled in india i mean i have go to so many countries i have been to many many countries in the world and i find that they are missing all these things like one simple question i ask in going to any country is do you have a former head of the government leading a peaceful life and the answer in many countries is no no go, go to pakistan and ask do you have a former head of the government leading a peaceful life no No. so they cannot have this transition from one government to another so they have solved the most basic issue of governance right that you if you go to africa you find that somebody has been ruling for 30 years somebody is ruling 40 years and when that person goes the next person puts him in jail right yeah. so we have solved many things we, we need to hit as i keep writing we need to hit 10% gdp growth whichever way works for us we need to hit 10% gdp growth we need to provide jobs to our young people who are going to come from the villages who are not going to be highly skilled and we need to make sure that the growth does not exclude them in fact growth must be based on them right. yes. so that is i think my view indeed sir that's a beautiful point that you have raised Uh, i was reading your article where you have presented pretty strong views on india's center state relations 
while asking the states to take control of growth rather than depending on the center to do all the work. You have mentioned uh, proactive investment into ag agriculture to negate the need of loan waivers. However, the Indian states struggle to raise funds on their own, depend largely on the center for loans and grants. What measures, according to you, can contribute to the financial independence of states? I don't want the states to be independent and I don't want the states to invest. But by the way, they managed to find the money for loan waivers. <laughs> yes. Even within the current system, they managed to find the money for loan waivers. Why not use that same money three years earlier to prevent the crisis? Crisis. Okay. Yes. But let's be serious. Uh, the state governments did not invest in agriculture. Not at all needed. There is no shortage. Uh, you know, the share of investment in India's GDP has come down. Right? Yes. The gross fixed capital formation is not where it used to be. Investment is coming down. It's not because we have become poor or we don't have investment money. It's because we don't have places to invest. So there is, as I said, a tremendous interest in young people whom I work with. I, I don't work with. I read their stuff. I've joined them. Uh, they are doing agriculture technology and tech. They are, and there is even, if you look at the agricultural websites, you find discussions of ag tech. And these people are coming in with uh, financial, fintech, financial yes. instruments yeah. that can provide investments in agriculture. So the investment will come in some form of private. We, our villages will change. It will not be the same investment things by the same farmers then not by the government. The government's job is to facilitate, bring in the technology. And we don't need to do agricultural extension anymore from the government because we can rely on the internet. And now even the farmers have cell phones. They don't have smartphones, but they have cell phones. And the ag tech and fintech can actually use this technology. So we need to actually get rid of some of the old musty habits of Patwari days of 110 years ago and to say, listen, uh, we need to give an entry into the rural areas of people who are young, motivated and ready to do something with the farmers, to bring them investment by uh, let us say financial engineering. Let's call it financial engineering because it's a risk. And yes. so how to model the risk so that you can sell the financial debt into many different places. Now, you know, financial debt is sometimes things that people don't understand. And I know I've had a lot of problems in getting financial engineering done, but I'm not an expert myself. But what I'm saying is the chief minister should say, listen, all of you young people, you are welcome here. Mm -hmm. We have somebody whom you can talk to, somebody who can, I mean, they, they have satellite data, they have all sorts of data, these people, they are harvesting the data, they are able to handle big data, machine learning, everything. You talk to them, they talk as if they are living in the next century. But on the ground, they are met with these people who are not willing to deal with them, to support them, facilitate them. So the first thing we need is to have the right attitude to let the modern new forces, which are not government forces, which are partly for profit and partly non-profit, mm -hmm. both of them to come in and say, listen, how can we promote agriculture? But actually you can't do much in agriculture, as I said, till you are able to shift some people out of there. Mm -hmm. Because the families have become larger, the plot size has become smaller, and you know the young people have no hope or future there. Because 40% labor force, 14% GDP, what are they doing? They're just wasting their time. You, know? you can't have 40% of producing 15% of your GDP. So we need to have a combination of moving people out of agriculture and helping those who are left behind. Mm -hmm. So we can't just say, oh, I'm doing agriculture. No, it is agriculture, you know, Sir Arthur Lewis, the dual economy, the outflow of labor, way back from 1950s, these workers will move. 
where will you move them? Will you move them to slums in big cities or are you going to move them to district headquarters? My suggestion is leave out the top five district headquarters in every state, go to the next five, build those so that these people can move there. Okay. And find jobs in small and medium enterprise. So it's an integrated view. Move these workers into the second level districts. Those should be your smart cities. Sure. And allow technology and finance to move into those people, those farmers who stay behind and bring them into the modern age, bring them into the modern age, but not all 40% of them. They cannot be brought into the modern age because they need to move into, you know, the smart cities, the 100 smart cities, they are not going to employ more people in those smart cities. What we need is to develop, as I say, maybe 100 districts. And each state should pick five to six districts. So that leaves 200 districts, 30 states, six. 200 districts to be developed in such a way that we don't have traffic congestion and we don't create slums and opportunities for these people is there to move out. So only then can agriculture be developed. So we don't need the money from the government in agriculture. We need the money from the government in developing the districts to where these people can actually move. So each person from east of Rajasthan doesn't go to west of Rajasthan. East of Rajasthan, you go to the district headquarters. I mean, you don't, there's not a rule, but that's where your job is. So that's where you will go. That's where the common pattern that we have observed. Yes. Indeed. Yes. I was reading your book on core economics, a beautiful compilation, sir, of all the concepts. What I like best about it uh, is that it is not, an, not a conventional book, but more of a conversation with the reader. How can our student benefit best from it? Uh, well, I'm happy to talk about it. It is a book that I've been thinking of writing for 15 years. But when the lockdown from the coronavirus came, I was sitting at home doing nothing. So, you know, you can't go out and all that. So I decided to write. But basically, I wanted to write something that has no mathematics, no calculus, nothing. Because, it, you know, at MIT, mathematics was not an important part because everybody knew mathematics. Right? So nobody could discuss mathematics. It was okay. I mean, if you are going to talk mathematics, you know, why waste my time, right? Talk economics to me, you know, Professor Kendallberger uh, used to teach international economics at the end of every seminar, he would say, guys, you know mathematics more than I do. So please leave that alone. Now kindly tell me what it means. And Samuelson would say the same thing. Look, please, here we don't talk mathematics. We only talk economics and I taught undergraduate economics at MIT and those students are super sharp they're sharper than you they know calculus 100 times better than you so you're not going to stand up there and tell them look this is the way we do it in calculus they'll say guy you know professor please this I can do in my sleep so why are you teaching me this so there we learned that you don't use mathematics as anything but a tool in your academic research once you've done your mathematics, don't talk about it. Talk about what it means. And then I started working outside and you talk to ministers, you talk to civil servants, you talk to regulators. They don't want to hear the theory. They don't want to hear the equations. They just want something simple. So I learned how to do this. What I have, I hope I've created is a book that is widely read by two sets of people. Uh, young people who are in college, but the college is not giving them a good education. Because let me say, there's a small town in Rajasthan called Jhalawad. My father mm -hmm. used to work there, so I don't know Jhalawad. I was, yeah. So you're sitting in Jhalawad. You don't have a good college. There's no professor of economics who's famous. You can read this book and you will get world-class knowledge. Or say you went to IIT or NIT, and you are two or three years in your job and you find, oh my God, they only taught me engineering and I don't know what to do about all these things they are discussing. 
this bond market, these interest rates, this GDP inflation, what the hell is all this? Read the book. And you will get, it is not biased, it's not prescriptive, it is not telling you how to handle the economy, it is trying to tell you how to understand the economy, how to understand the public debate, how to equip you to understand. These days, you know, on the internet, all knowledge is available. It's not like in our times when only the professors knew. Today, all knowledge is there. So this book is a way to start. If you want to know more about some subject, Google it and you will find hundreds of things. Right? So there's no issue. But where to start? This is the starting point. So I hope, and I've written it with a worldwide uh, audience in mind. It's not on any one country. It's quite a bit about the US, but there's quite a bit about of India. In fact, this point is I'm making to you. 40% is the agricultural labor force, 15% GDP. There are two charts about it. Yes. <laughs> so that's how I can say. And, you know, when we talk about so many, so it is meant to be read without any previous knowledge. And it's certainly not a textbook. It is as if I'm talking to you. So that's my hope and my aim. And I'd like to, uh, we are going to have a print edition out soon, print on demand from pothi.com. Uh, not, you know, again, I'm using new technology. It's not like we print a thousand books, try to sell it in bookstores. I mean, this is all aimed at young people, you know. They know how to read e-books and they know what print on demand is and they can get it, right? So that's my hope uh, that in India and worldwide, uh, people are able to use this book to increase their understanding of the economy and form their own opinions. There are no preformed opinions here. You form your own opinions as to how to go. But before you can form your own opinions, you have to understand how the Reserve Bank of India controls interest rates. Then you can say, should it do it or not do it? You have to understand how the bond markets work. You have to understand how inflation is measured, how it's not so accurate, how it could be off the mark. Even the measurement is not clear. So all these things which are very basic, uh, that's what I have tried to put into place. Yes, indeed, sir. That's a great, great book. And I personally recommend all the students that they should read because it is written for a layman as well so they can understand economics. Yeah, it is. Well, I would say it's written not for a layman. It's written for senior politicians. <laughs> 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 who don't want uh, <laughs> because I have to deal with them in many countries you know you go there like I had to deal with a minister in Indonesia and I had to explain a subsidy I'll take one minute to talk yeah, to you I had yeah, to sure. explain to him how to deliver a subsidy and he was objecting to my method so my boss said so both you have convinced us you go and talk to that minister and explain to him we are not going to do it it's your know. So I went to him and said, sir, you are an Asian and I am an Asian. Let's talk like Asians. He says, fine. So I said, sir, if you want to help your nephew to buy a house, right? He said, yeah, okay. He said, will you give the subsidy money to him or will you deposit it in the bank and say, if the guy comes up with the rest of it, then you take this. He says, yeah, it's a good idea. If I give it to him, he might waste it. I said, exactly, sir. So you don't give the subsidy to the person who is to be subsidized. You give the subsidy in the place where the final transaction will take place. He said, yeah. So my idea was that people who are buying solar home systems in Indonesia, and by the way, this is what the World Bank is implementing throughout Asia. We have it in Bangladesh. A, ho a home in rural Bangladesh buys a solar home system. It costs about 300 US dollars. They pay 250 and the 50 is paid by the Bangladesh government agency to the dealer. So first you get the 250 from the household and you then get the 50 from the agency. Mm -hmm. And the money never goes to the household. So this was a crazy scheme and the minister objected, but I told him in these simple Asian terms and mm -hmm. he said, go. It's a fruit. 
Because don't show me some charts or diagrams. And this, <laughs> by the way, my one of my major innovations in the World Bank is now implementing it in every solar rural project across the world. That the house, the dealer who sells the solar system goes to the household and says, "Listen, it's two fifty, or you negotiate the price. I don't care. You negotiate the price. Whatever they pay, it's fine." You take 50 from me, you bring the serial numbers, you bring the proof that you have put it in that person's house. And by the way, in a, let me congratulate the Bangladesh agency, it's called IDCOL. They're supposed to sample a number of households and go and check whether the system is there. And I asked them, how do you form the sample? They laughed at me. They said, we check everyone. <laughs> so they are very good. They have created a huge success in Bangladesh. We have. Uh, uh, more than 4 million rural households running on solar systems where the grid is not there. But the subsidy method is this, which the Indonesian finance minister agreed with me based on this simple example. So I had to, what I'm saying is that this is the way the book is meant for senior ministers. Yes, Yes, but this book you you are bringing efficiency into the system, and that's a great great thing that you can save Thank the taxpayers' money and bringing efficiency into especially the subsidy. Thank you. Uh, apart from this, sir, uh, we have a lot of students, those who are preparing for a PhD or those who are pursuing PhD. And uh, any last thought if they aspire for uh, to do PhD from MIT or any other university abroad? You know. Getting into a top PhD program is very difficult. It's a very competitive world. It was easier in our times because the competition was less. And today, every country has woken up. Every country is trying to send its people all over the world. It wasn't like that when we were young. So we were, you know, we didn't have the material goods that you have today, yes. but we didn't have the competition. competition it was much easier, yeah. you know. You were mildly educated. That was good enough. Today, you need to be a really top student. So competition is very, very tough. Uh, but to get into any PhD program in economics, unfortunately, uh, you have to score very high in mathematics. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality, that if you are going to be in an academic program in economics, it's going to be highly mathematical. There's just no way around it. Absolutely mm -hmm. none. So we can say that, yes, I can write without mathematics, but I had to be good at mathematics good like, to get here. So you have to be very good at mathematics and you have to have uh, some uh, clear reason to do your PhD. Now, you know, many people shouldn't do a PhD, honestly, because it really prepares you for an academic career. And it's a waste of your four years or five years if you don't want to be an academic. Right? Yes. So if you want a job and you have four or five years of earnings after your master's or whatever, then that four or five years of earnings you shouldn't. And plus, it's bloody tough to do a PhD. You know, your life is hell. You don't want to be in that hell. You want to be in the comfortable job. So I would say be clear why you want your PhD. Be very clear. Now, if it is a springboard into the U.S., then that's fine. You know, there's still the visas are easier for professors. And after a couple of years of being a professor, you might quit and do something else. But be, you know, it's uh, not for everybody. PhD yeah. is not for everybody. But if you're going to do it, uh, you have to be very strong in mathematics. And what it really means is uh, that the score in GRE or whatever test you take has to be right at the top just has to be so like in our days we had no books nothing you know we just went and took the test there was no preparation because where i was in jaipur there was no book called gre test so i never yes. seen a gre test so you just went and took it first time right yes. there's no preparation nothing because nobody had any preparation nothing you know we were living in the prehistoric ages but yes. today you have to prepare you have to get your grade up in the GRE and you have to have a good recommendation letter. 
and there is actually no harm in uh, going to uh, say any of the top 50 universities in the US because the job market is there for such PhDs. I mean, I was a professor at American University and many of my students who did their PhD with me have good jobs. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on to our show. And at last few words of encouragement uh, you can uh, give to our Ecoholics team and the support staff. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I think you are doing a great job of uh, tapping so many people uh, whom you have successfully tapped to bring their knowledge and wisdom into one place where everybody can actually see it. I guess you maybe you are charging, maybe you are not charging, I'm not sure. But it's affordable and doable and quick. And it's a great tapping of the new technologies uh, to serve the needs of young people. And so I congratulate you and I wish you the best and hope that uh, we meet again at some point. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Right. Because Thinking Tree is a show where we provide enough clarity in economics. Like currently we are uh, facing with fake news, a lot of conceptually wrong economics. So that's the main motive of Thinking Tree. It's a not-for-profit initiative of Ecoholics. So to provide quality economics. Once okay. again, thank you so much, sir. Thank okay. you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you, sir.